morning. Father, we tasted of your presence and we delighted in your presence. We are happy that we could sing praises unto you, that we could honor your name, your word, and honor you yourself. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done thus far. We pray that as the rest of the service proceeds, that it will all be about giving glory and honor unto you, unto you only, Lord. We pray that you will increase and that the speaker will decrease. As your word comes to your people this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, glory and praise be unto God. Last time I was here, I, I did promise you all that I would speak to you all about life in heaven, what it will be like, and what the Word of God has shown us from His Word about the things that he has promised for us because his word says that I has not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the understanding of man the things that God has prepared for them who love him but this morning I have to break my promise because you see man appoints but God disappoints sorry God appoints, <laughs> man disappoints. But actually, it's doing up the word because the Lord laid it on my heart to bring this word instead this morning. And I have to follow his leading because really and truly, I really wanted, because I did it with the um, Longdonville people, I really wanted to share with you all the wonderful and wondrous things that God has in store for us. And I wanted to share that with you all. That was my purpose. But somehow God said to me, it was just not in my spirit to bring that message. So I am here this morning to bring something else to you. But it's from the word of God, so it's going to be good. Once it's from the word of God, it's going to be good. Amen. So my message to you this morning is, many are called, but few are chosen. God calls many to salvation. In fact, he calls the entire world to salvation. He has issued a call. When Jesus went to Calvary, he died for the sins of the world. For God so loved the world, the whole entire world, that he gave the world a gift, the gift of the life of his son. That's the gift he gave the world. When he went to Calvary, the scriptures tell us that he was wounded for our transgressions. Not for anything that he had done. He was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. It also tells us that when he went to Calvary, he bore the sins of the whole world in his body. His death was a death for the sin of mankind. And having taken on the sins of all the world, he made salvation therefore available to all the world. Men, all men could be saved by the word of the living God. All men. Because the sins, the forgiveness of God was made available to all mankind. But God has given us choice. And while he has made salvation available to everybody, there are some who will not respond. But forgiveness is there for all the world. It's for man to come to Christ and receive it because he already took upon the world, upon his body, the sins of the world. So all sins that man has, man only has to come to God, make a choice to come to God. And because his sins are already forgiven, God will receive him. Amen. 
But this morning, I want to talk to you about many are called and few chosen. And the word call is going to be very important for us this morning. Call. And my text this morning is Matthew 22 from verse 1. Matthew 22 from verse 1. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call, to call, those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again, second time, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted car cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it. And went their ways. One to his own farm. Another to his business. And the rest seized his servants. Treated them spitefully. And killed them. But when the king heard about it. He was furious. And he sent out his armies destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways and as many as you find, say after me, as many as you find, invite to the wedding. And I see the constant invitation come to the wedding invite to the wedding so these servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found both bad and good and the wedding hall was filled with guests but when the king came in to see the guests he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment so he said to him friend how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot. Take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Called. Many are called but few are chosen. You know the songwriter who, who wrote that Jesus is tenderly calling thee home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will thou roam? Father and Father away Calling today Calling today Jesus is calling He's tenderly calling today He's tenderly calling He's calling to everybody Another songwriter says, Whosoever will to the Lord may come. Whosoever will to the Lord may come. Whosoever will to the Lord may come. He will not turn him away. Jesus, 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 Jesus. 
heals the broken hearted Jesus 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 heals the broken hearted he'll never turn him away whosoever will but before we go to whosoever will in terms of who God calls into his kingdom there's a certain amount of people that God has chosen there's a certain amount of people that God has chosen and they get what is called let us call it the effectual call of God it's an irresistible call and it's extended to the chosen alone it's an irresistible call that is extended to the chosen alone sometimes the Bible speaks of the chosen as the elect of God they mean the same because next year we will have elections and what we do is we choose a government by electing them so the words are the same when Peter and Paul refers to us as the elect of God we are the chosen of God God has chosen some and it's in his word that he extends his irresistible call to the chosen alone the book of Romans tells us, Romans chapter 1, chapter 8, sorry. The book of Romans tells us, chapter 8 and verse 30. Take it from verse 29. A passage of scripture I'm sure you know, for whom he foreknew whom he foreknew he also predestined he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so those who were chosen by God the elect he is going to be making a number of Jesuses out of them to be conformed to the image of his son. But that foreknowledge doesn't mean that God stood down at the beginning of time and knew in advance, foreknew, knew in advance who would be saved, who would respond to his call. That foreknowledge there in the Greek really means preordained. God preordained some for salvation. Through his divine and sovereign will, he purposed, he purposed through his divine sovereign will, who will be saved. For whom he foreknew, foreknew, for knowledge there doesn't mean he sat back and knew in advance that Sister Juliana would come and save him and come to him for salvation, sir. Juliana was preordained, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That word firstborn, unlike our JW friends, doesn't mean that Jesus was born like a human being, son of God. Firstborn there, according to the Greek language, means that he was the preeminent son. When the Bible speaks of Jesus as the firstborn, the correct Greek understanding of the word is that he is the preeminent son, the unique son. All of us will be his sons because we will be conformed to his image. We will be Christ-like. 
But there is one son who God considers the firstborn, the preeminent one, the unique son, Jesus. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. One day we heard the irresistible call of God. He called us. And whom he called, he justified. When he called us and we responded to his call to salvation, his irresistible call, we couldn't resist it. He justified us. In other words, he made us righteous in his sight. So we, are, we were no longer, we still are no longer sinners anymore. We are righteous. He justified us. It's a legal term. I don't want to go into it. But I think I explained justification to you many months ago. So having predestined, one day we heard his voice calling us. The chosen that is. And we responded. And when we responded, he justified us. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. These works of grace in our lives, these works of grace, are all done from the predestination, from the foreknowledge, to the predestination, to being called, to being justified. Those are finished works in our lives. The only one that isn't finished yet, the only work of grace that isn't finished yet, is these he also glorified. Our glorification has not happened yet. But it will happen when we die and we enter his presence in heaven. And when we come back to earth in our new bodies. But notice, the Bible says, these he also glorified. And I always pay attention to the fact that it is written in the past tense. Everything there. Because as far as God is concerned, that is his will. And it's accomplished. So even though we haven't received our glorification yet, it's in the past tense. He also glorified. One day, that's the assurance we have. But call Ephesians chapter 1 tells us about our chosen status with God. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us, For God chose us, chose us, chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Before God even said, let there be light. And there was light. Before He began to create the planet, God had already chosen you. See that word before? Just as He chose us, in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons to adopt a child is to bring him into the family and give him the status of a son or daughter even though he was not born biologically into the family. That's what God has done for us. He created a family and he brought us into the family. He adopted us from being a sinner. Made us righteous. Made us righteous. And he adopted us. That's why we are called the sons of God. We are one of millions of sons like Jesus that he has created. Men who will be conformed to the image of his son. And he did it according to the good pleasure of his will. He did all of that. He predestined us according to the good pleasure of his will. That was his will. Nobody can quarrel with that. He was pleased to do that for us. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted 
in the beloved. But the key thing I want to show you there about the chosen and the calling that he chose us. If you read, I don't go into the interest of time, Second Timothy 1 9 says, The foundation of the world, God created us with a purpose. All of us have a purpose. From the foundation of the world. The book of Acts tells us if we have any doubts about the fact that God chooses, chooses for salvation. Acts chapter 13 and verse 48 tells us. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad when the Gentiles began to hear the gospel. They were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. Listen to this. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. You didn't get that? As many as had been appointed to eternal life God appointed us. He appointed us. Having predestined us. As many as were appointed to eternal life. They believed. Because you see, it was an irresistible call. The Bible says, not by works of grace that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Not by works of righteousness. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy. He said, by grace you are faith. By grace are you saved. Grace is an unmerited favor. None of us deserved it. By grace we are saved. True faith. And listen to this. And that faith is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. God gave you the gift to believe when you heard the gospel. He gave you the faith to believe. You didn't believe on your own. Having predestined you, preordained you for salvation, when you heard the word of God, He gave you the faith to believe. It was a gift from Him. That gift is not of yourselves, it is a gift from God. The faith you exercise to believe was given to you. was not of your own will. Because you are chosen. And the book of John chapter 6 tells us John chapter 6 tells us Jesus speaking here says and verse 37 John 6 and 37 tells us all that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out all that the father gives me every believer who God has given to salvation through his son will come to him everyone all that the father gives me there's a certain amount of people that God has chosen to give to his son all that the father gives me will come to me bound to happen you're bound to come to God because he will give you the faith to believe because he predestined you and verse 44 says same chapter no man, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him Amen. you were drawn when your time came and you heard the call God drew you because you are the object of God's special love God drew you So is God fair? That's a question we should ask. Is God a righteous God? That he should choose some for eternal life with him? 
and reject others? Is he fair? Abraham said of him when he was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham began to plead and say, perhaps there might be 50 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. He wasn't 50. Then Abraham came back and said, perhaps he came right on to about five. And they were not five righteous people. And then Abraham told him, he asked God an important question. He said, will not the judge of all the earth do right? So Abraham testifies to the righteousness of God and the justice of God. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? He can only do right. He cannot do anything else but right. So is he fair to choose some and not to choose others? So we go back to our text. And we will see, I want to point out to you this morning, the fairness of God. There's a balance between his divine sovereignty, his divine sovereignty, rulership, and human responsibility in salvation. But this is very important. I'm taking you back to my text just now. There is a balance between the sovereignty of God the sovereignty of God. If you are having a wedding, you can choose who you want to come to your wedding. Don't you? It's your wedding. It's God's will. So, you might choose to reject me and I might be pleased. But it's your right to choose. And therefore, it's also God's right to choose. If you're having a party, if the president of the country having a, a children's Christmas party and he invite my child, I can't get vexed to that. It's his party. He is sovereign over his party. He rules over his party. But God rules over the world and the affairs of the world. And he's right to choose. He has a right to choose. However, that divine sovereignty of God, his rightness to choose, is balanced when it comes to salvation by the responsibility of human beings to respond to the call. Because there's another call. That last call was an irresistible, effectual call. This one's a general call that has gone out to all mankind. And there's an element of human responsibility for men to respond to that call because God gave man the right to choose. Like I said earlier, when Jesus died, he died for the sins of the entire world, all men. But there's some responsibility on the part of all men to act in their own interests and to respond and answer the call. So there's another set of people who can be saved. And that is those who use their human responsibility and responded. We're going to meet three groups in my text this morning. Three groups. So let's go back to my text. Matthew 22. You see, there are those who heard the call and they spurned the invitation of the king. Let me repeat that. In the parable that Jesus gave there, there were those who heard the call to salvation. But they rebuff the king. They rebuff the offer, the invitation of the king. Let's look 
Back at our, te- our text in Matthew 22. Now, this is what happened to all men. That's why nobody's excused before God for the eternal souls if they end up in hell. In the parable, Jesus says, He sent out His servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Underline that. They were not willing to come. His invitation to salvation is there for all. That's why I sang that song. That Jesus is tenderly calling. Whosoever will, whosoever will, whosoever, anybody. You see, he invited the good and the bad. In the text there, he invited the good and the bad. Anybody. He extended his invitation to his son's wedding to everybody. But there are men, Sister Karen, in our world today who were not willing to come. Men have rebuffed the offer, the invitation of the king to come unto me. That is why no man will have an excuse. Because we are your servants and we are the ones who let men and women know we spread the gospel. He sent us out to call them, to call men. That's why at the heart of every church should be a vigorous evangelistic program. Men have to be told. They have to hear the call of God. And many will not be willing to come. Many will not be willing to accept the king's invitation to his son's wedding. Three times we see this spurning of the king's offer. Verse 3, he said they were not willing to come. In verse 5, they made light of it. He sent out the servants again. And verse 5 says, he told them, come to the wedding. But they made light of it and they went their ways. They heard the call of God, the king. They heard his invitation. But again, there are those who will hear and they will respond just like these people here. Make light of it. In other words, they dismiss the invitation. They dismiss it. That's how men act with God, you know. You can invite people to come to church on a Sunday morning. Oh God, I'll come tomorrow, man. I'll come tomorrow. Next week, next week, next month. They don't take their soul salvation seriously. They made light of it and they went their ways. That is so sad. They went their ways. You see, listen to the parable. Choice. They went their ways. That is so true of many who hear the gospel. They make light of it and they go about the business after that. They dismiss it. Some went to their own farm and another to their own business. So the reflection here is people who hear God's salvation. They say, well, when I finish my studies, I will come to God. When I finish, establish my business. When I get married and have my children and I settle down. Some to their own farm, some to their own businesses. And others, they seized the servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. You can't tell the gospel that from countries like Iran, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates. You can't go and preach the gospel in India. They're killing Christians in India. So those are the kinds of responses that people have. Now we're dealing with human responsibility and salvation. The first set of people he invited made light of it. 
This means that tell the king take a blight. They were not willing to come. Others made light of it and they went their ways and others began to kill the king's servants. And he sent out armies and he destroyed them. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. That is the king's judgment. They were not worthy. They were not worthy. It's a sad commentary on people who hear the message of salvation. And God says of them, when they turn their back on him, they were not worthy. Nobody can't blame God for where they end up, you know. They were not worthy. Verse 9 says, Therefore, he sent his servants again, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. That's why I sang that song, Whosoever will, as many, as many as you find. God is offering salvation to everybody. And He's inviting everybody to come and dine. But look at the response of men. Look at the response of men. Whosoever will. Whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation over vale and hill. Tis the loving Father calls the wanderer home. Whosoever will may come, may come. Whosoever, as many as you find, invite them. So the servants went out, as the, the parable shows. Gather together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. The wedding hall was filled with guests. Bad and good came because salvation is for all men. Now in those days, if the king invited you to the wedding and you didn't have clothes, the king used to provide clothes for you. So when the king comes out to meet his guests in this filled hall, he finds one man who didn't have on his wedding garment. And the king said, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. In other words, he had no excuse. He couldn't answer. And so it will be with many men on Judgment Day. They will have no excuse. So we see another kind of people who will inherit salvation. Not, not just the chosen from the foundations of the world, but men who exercised their human responsibility and accepted the invitation of the king to his, wed his son's wedding. And they put on the king's garment of righteousness. They put on the king's garments of righteousness. But in the church you will find those who are like this man. They refuse the king's garment. The righteousness that Christ offers, they, will, they refuse it. They're in the church. They're probably in the choir. They're probably out doing evangelistic work. They're probably raising their hand and hiding everybody and praising the Lord. But they have refused to put on the king's garment. That's why Jesus said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. Some will say, but Lord, I serve you, I did this, I did that. I was in the church. I supported the pastor and the work of the and you say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me. I never knew you. Because they refused to put on his garment. 
you are speechless. But I want us to, in case we think that God is unfair, which I open by telling you that, contemplate whether God was fair to choose some from the foundations of the world for salvation. And to not choose others. When we look at these three categories of people, the chosen, those who came to the wedding and put on his garments, those are the ones who responded to the call, the whosoever who will may come call. They came to his wedding, that means the fact that they put on his garments, and this probably means that they became righteous. And then there's this other guy who was pretending visibly. You see them in church visibly. They look like they are Christians, but not really. There are the tears growing among the grain. And then you have, I want you to notice this, for those of you who still want to be convinced that God may not be fair. See how many times in the parable the king was persistent. Three times he sent out his servants. He pursued the salvation and the souls of men. Three times he sent out. He was persistent. He didn't give up once. He didn't say, well, I made my offer of salvation available to you all. All your sins were born in the body of my son on the cross. So I will not sit back and wait for you all to come to me, to answer my call. No. He persisted. He pursued them three times. He didn't give up on them. That is the kind of God. And that is why there is human responsibility in salvation. And men will have no excuse when they come before God. So the king noticed, rebuffed all these times, spurned all these times, but the king is still persistent. That is the heart of God towards the sinner. The king is still persisting. In, tri- in verses 3, 4, and 9, you will see how many times he sent out his servants. Say, go again, go again, go again. Don't give up on them. The king, we saw the people's rejection of his insister, his persistence. Those who were not willing, verse 3, they made light of it. Verse 5. They went their separate ways. Verse 5. And the king's judgment upon them was they were not worthy. They were not worthy. It's a sad commentary for sinners who refuse Christ. But God has done his part. He kept pursuing their souls. You know why they reject God? As I come to my last scripture verse. They reject God according to John chapter 3. John's gospel chapter 3. All of us know John 3.16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But I want you to also know John 3, 19. And it says, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Because their deeds were evil. That is why they spurned the king's offer. That's why they rebuffed and rejected the king. Men love darkness rather than light. But our job is to be like the servants of the king and go out on his behalf and invite and call. Invite and call. 
the last book of the Bible, the last chapter of the book of the Bible, of Revelation, chapter 22. The last chapter, in the last book, I mean, that should be the last page in your Bible. It tells us, chapter 22, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever, that word comes up all the time, whoever desires, because the Bible, in the, in the parable, Jesus said, both bad and good came to his wedding. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Let him take the water of life freely. Come unto me. You all know that song, huh? Come on. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Hear me and be blessed. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. But the invitation is there. Come unto me. I have died for your sins. Forgiveness is available. Just come. All the sins you ever committed, I took on Calvary and laid on myself. Just come. But men preferred darkness rather than light. That's why the parable king says they were not worthy. Those who didn't take my invitation, they were not worthy. Bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Heavenly Father, in no other name but the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you for the treasures of your word, mighty God. We pray in the name of Jesus that your word will remain with your people. But above all, O oh God, that we will be inspired and spurred on to go out and invite because men have a responsibility to themselves to embrace the good news when they receive the general call to come unto me. Give us, O oh God, deep within us the desire to look outside the walls of this church and to go out and tell men and invite men to your wedding and your son's wedding. Bless your people, Lord, with the energy, the purpose, the desire to bring honor and glory to your name in a world of darkness. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen, amen and amen. That is the word of God to you this morning. May be blessed unto you. Thank you, Pastor Keith Jackson.